Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Lectures on Equality and Justice in America, our first of this term, and actually our first of our pandemic challenged to, uh, 2020 uh, academic year. Um, we are delighted this evening uh, to have Tom Etzel with us, and Rob Smith will be introducing him a little later in the evening. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is to talk, is first of all, to welcome you uh, to the Mark School, to welcome you to Baruch College. Uh, I have the pleasure of being Dean of the Mark School and of introducing uh, these lectures now for more than 15 years, although we've been running these lectures and they have been a mainstay of our ability to think about the issues of social justice, to think about the issues of equity in law, in economics, and in other facets of American society uh, through the generous support of Erwin and Rosalind Engelman. Uh, uh, Rosalind's parents were, of course, Lily and Nathan Ackerman, and it is in their memory that the series has served us so well for so long. Um, I'm delighted to welcome this evening a member of the Engelman family, uh, Marion Engelman Lotto, uh, to talk about uh, the family's commitment to this uh, series and the values that undergird it. Uh, Marion was a former member of the faculty here in the Mark School. Uh, she has served in a variety of roles uh, in social justice organizations as an attorney uh, and teaches law now both at Yale University and the University of Vermont. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to a Brute College stage uh, Professor Marion Engelman Lotto. Thanks so much, Dean. I bring, and by the way, if you hear drums in the background, I am sitting in New York and we have our seven o'clock uh, ceremony outside my window. So I apologize for that. I, deep, I bring deep appreciation from the Engelman family that created this lecture series in honor of my grandparents. Um, thank you to Dean Birdstall, to all um, of you. There's something blocking our screen. I'm sorry? Oh, that's one person. I'll keep going while you resolve your screen. And you might want to okay. put the phone on mute. Um, so I want to thank all of you, particularly Baruch students, um, who are enduring more time on Zoom to join us tonight. And I'll keep my remarks brief in respect for your time and how much time I know we all spend on Zoom. I want to thank Professor Smith, our Ackerman Chair, and of course, Thomas Adsall. I'm looking forward to uh, his remarks. Um, a big thanks also to Angelina Delgado who made all of this happen. Now more than ever, I know we're clinging to the New York Times. I know I am to the New York Times, to NPR, to PBS for facts and thoughtful perspectives. As one of the titles of our speaker's column recently said, the whole of democracy is in grave danger at this moment. And it's critical that we continue to hold a mirror up to ourselves and face stark realities, especially on issues of equality and justice. My grandparents, Nathan and Lily Ackerman, for whom this lecture series is named, came to this country as a refuge. And it was a refuge for them. Not that it was perfect, although they thought it was perfect, but it was a refuge. But it has not been and is not today similarly a refuge for many others. And once here, people are treated differently depending on the color of their skin, their country of origin, and their religion. The idea of this lecture series, and I wanna recognize the vision of my parents, Erwin and Rosalind Engelman, who I hope are on, and my sister, Madeline Cohen, who is on the phone, um, to create a space where we grapple with issues of equality and justice, and particularly inequalities on the basis of race and income, and to addressing these inequalities to achieve justice. Not just, we're never gonna reach that level of perfection, but it's important to grapple with them. And that, that struggle, that struggle to really face ourselves and to improve is needed now more than ever. So many thanks to the school for continuing this lecture series. And uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Dean. Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, and that just, uh, there's inspiring affirmation of the values that have undergirded this lecture series uh, and that of course propel so much work in the Marx School overall. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Ackerman Chair uh, and tonight's moderator, Professor Robert Courtney Smith. Uh, Rob is a professor in the Marx School of Public and International Affairs. His work centers on migration and the legal status of people, how that legal status affects people's life trajectories, uh, has written distinguished scholarship on that and adjacent topics uh, and made the move as many 
have here in the Marx School, but Marv does it with particular panache uh, to make his scholarship resonate in the areas that he studies uh, by preparing uh, research that goes into amicus briefs, by working with organizations that actually foster uh, the well being of migrants in the New York area and elsewhere, uh, and putting into practice work that is conceived both as extraordinary uh, scholarship, but extraordinary scholarship that helps us to do better the things that we want to do and helps people live better lives. Uh, Rob has for the past two years been serving as Ackerman Chair. Uh, I would want to recognize two prior Ackerman Chairs that I see around the bezel and pardon me if I miss any more, but Professor Sonia Jarvis is with, here, uh, with us here as is Professor Ryan Allen Smith uh, and welcome to you all. Uh, Rob, terrific, terrific to have you on hand this evening. Let me turn it over to you to introduce the program and our speaker. Thank you very much, David, for those kind words. And thank you, I'll echo the thanks to the Engelman family for establishing this uh, lecture series on uh, uh, equality and social justice. We, we need it today, I think now more than ever. Um, so um, in introducing uh, Tom Edsel for tonight, I, I was reminded of the quote that always comes up, the famous quote by Reverend Martin Luther, King about the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think Martin Luther King would have recognized that that arc isn't straight and that on voting rights, America's arc has been warped by political leaders who, in my view, uh, and in their own words, don't want all Americans to vote. They really only want their voters to vote. Uh, there's the old quip that in, in some countries, uh, uh, voters choose their leaders and in other countries, leaders choose their voters. And I think um, the country has been moving dangerously close to the second. And the, the leaders, the people that they don't want to vote are disproportionately black and brown and the people who had been excluded from the vote to begin with. So these are not clever insights. These are things that, the, that, that political leaders uh, of this school have said. Um, Mr. Edsel's lecture tonight will focus on systemic voter suppression and the inability of our political system to fairly represent millions of voters. He follows others who have spoken about voting rights and voter suppression in this lecture series, including Janai Nelson of the NAACP and Juan Cartagena of the Latino Justice Fund. This is, and I think it's come home incre with increasing um, fierceness in the last year that the vote is the most urgent right that we have because of the right on which all the other rights Americans enjoy that are protected, but also by which they can be quashed or manipulated or taken away. So any introduction of Mr. Edsel would have to focus on his many accomplishments, which I will put out in here in very abbreviated form. So Thomas Edsel has been a weekly opinion columnist for the Times since 2011, covering demographic strategic trends in American politics. He was the Joseph Pulitzer and Edith Pulitzer Moore Chair in Public Affairs, journalism at Columbia from 2006 to 2014, uh, and has also been an adjunct there. He covers, covers national, covered national politics for the Washington Post for 25 years um, until 2006, and has been a contributing writer for the New York Review of Books, The New Republic, The Atlantic, The National Journal, The Washington Monthly. He's written five books, including The Age of Austerity, Building Red America, Chain Reaction, The Impact of Race, Rights, and Taxes on American Politics, Power and Money, and the New Politics of Inequality. He was the winner of the uh, Carrie McWilliams Award of the American Political Science Association, the Noel Markwell Media Award, and a Pulitzer finalist in 1992 in general nonfiction. He lives with his wife, Mary, in Washington, DC. Finally, any introduction of Thomas Edsel in an academic setting would be remiss if it did not note that Tom Edsel is at heart an academic and a scholarly analyst. Um, I always read Tom's columns and I learn from them. And I think perhaps more than anything, I enjoy his columns because they take academic research seriously and they get those insights into the public debate in ways they wouldn't otherwise get out there. He gets our work and we learn from his insights. So without any further ado, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Thomas Edsel to be the fall 2020 Ackerman lecturer. And thank you, Tom, for accepting our invitation. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I want to make a point of uh, honoring Baruch for holding these lectures. 
for the Engelman family for sponsoring them and uh, Rob Smith for continuing to maintain them. And uh, I hope I can uh, contribute to this whole process to David Birdsell, uh, to Carla Ann Robbins, who uh, is a good teacher there, Sonia Jarvis, who I see on the screen is, is watching. Uh, uh, I have always, I have been very impressed with Baruch for a, year, for a few years now, really from a dinner that I came to, uh, I can't remember how many years ago, uh, but graduates spoke and th their stories were truly American stories of getting an education for very, for no cost back then, and then moving up the ladder and becoming very successful people. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was moving. And I was just very uh, struck by the school and what it has done uh, for the New York community, but for the whole world, really. Uh, so at any rate, I just want to make sure I, I thank everyone on that score. For this talk, I, I want to get into territory that is a little new to me. So it may be a little rough going. And if, if I am confusing at all, please uh, ask questions at the end. Uh, uh, there should be a Q&A period. Uh, I am sort of working since this election, trying to work through what happened and how the vote has been affected and uh, basically the same issues that the title of the lecture uh, describes, but taking it to the present. And the, the last election was a mixed bag. Uh, at one level, the Democrats did well at the national level. Uh, at another level, at the congressional and state legislative level, Democrats did not do well. So it was just kind of a split screen election for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party, in terms of its control over redistricting, uh, does not have the level that it had in 2010. And let me add at this point that, that control over redistricting is probably the most effective tool of voter suppression available beyond actually barring people from vote, of having uh, uh, the, the kind of laws that segregated uh, uh, states like Alabama and Mississippi had, given the inability to violate civil rights laws, the best tactic is to basically uh, split and break up or lump together all the voters that you are opposed to and then spread your voters out with just enough numbers to be able to win in as many districts as possible. Uh, the Republicans were extraordinarily successful uh, doing this in 2011, because leading up to the 2010 election, they uh, put a huge amount of money and resor other resources into winning state legislative and gubernatorial elections. And they had tri, what are called trifectas, which means control of the governorship, the state house and the state senate in, uh, in something like more than 25 states. And some of those states were key for redistricting. Not only the traditional ones where they control like Texas and Florida, but the whole Midwest uh, range except for Minnesota, basically, and Illinois. Uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan all were uh, trifecta states, and the Republicans used that power to great effect. This year, they do not have the governorships in those three states, which means that the governor can veto whatever they're going to do and there have been a growing number of states that have adopted commission or other means of beginning the process uh, that are likely to decrease or, or actually in some cases prevent real gerrymandering of any kind. There still will be more power in the hands of, in the hands of Republicans to set legislative districts, 
but less so than was the case 10 years ago. Uh, gerrymandering, as I say, I think is the in most effective voter suppression tool. You make one side, whether it is by race or by party uh, or by geography, you make one side waste as many votes as possible by concentrating them together and you uh, take your voters and you try to make them at least 52, 53% of as many districts as possible while trying to make as many of the opposition party into 100% or as close as you can get to it, districts that, that will then vote. And so if you have 100% Democrats, for example, 49% of them are effectively wasted. They, they, you don't need those voters to win. They would be much more useful to you as a Democrat if you had them in other districts where you could compete. Uh, and that, that, is, that, that has been the, precisely the strategy that Republicans used uh, very well. It's gonna be less so going into 2022 but it's still uh, they, when the re, when there will be new districts across the country, both congressional and state legislative, but it still will be a tilt in favor of the Republicans. I want to go through this using a PowerPoint, and I hope I do this right. Uh, uh, I'm looking at this now, here we go. Now I hope, can people see this now? Rob, they can see this? Okay. Uh, uh, voter suppression, for me, that the best definition of that is, is anytime voter, votes are not equal. And you can do that, as I say here, in, through gerrymandering, the Electoral College has resulted in unequal votes. Wyoming has in effect far more voting power in the, in the Electoral College than California. Uh, you can do it through uh, uh, legislation and to take for example, Texas where they, or executive order, Texas reduced the number of voting locations, I think to, just one per county and voter and drop boxes particularly. That meant that a county like uh, uh, the county that Houston is in had the same number of, had one drop box compared to a very rural county with very few voters would have one uh, uh, drop box. That is a, inherently a system of inequality. We also saw this in the apparent efforts by the Postal Service uh, to reduce uh, delivery systems at a, in a year when Democrats, much more than Republicans, would be using uh, uh, mail-in votes. And if by reducing that service, they made it more worrisome. I don't know if they, anyone has been able to track any actual consequences but it was a worrisome process. Um, I, I would say there, there are three kinds of gerrymandering that are really important. And I'm gonna to focus today mostly on the third. There's racial gerrymandering, uh, which many of you are already quite familiar with, partisan gerrymandering, which people who are follow politics know pretty well, but something now is that we now have what I would call structural gerrymandering. And that's not necessarily the fault of either party, but it is a result of polarization, geographic differences now between the parties uh, and a whole sequence of developments that I hope I can go through in this, uh, uh, this lecture. Uh, there have been, in my view, five major developments over the what roughly the last 20 to 30 years. The first of those developments has, is 
the rise of an elite Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, when I was young, which was all too many years ago, uh, was known as the lunch pail party. The, the working man, the working woman, the, the person you'd see at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. on the subway uh, going to a construction site. That was the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party now, we shall see, has become increasingly a party of the well-educated and the people who are economically successful. Uh, this is a very different Democratic Party and it has significant consequences. We, the point two is we've had the, a, the emergence really of white identity. It used to be that sociologists and others who tried to, who explored black identity and Hispanic identity, gay identity, they found that when a group is in a minority, they do develop a sense of identity about who they are. And, uh, but whites in the majority just basically felt in the past, no need to have feel an identity. Over the, say the past 15, 20 years, whites have increasingly come to see themselves, not all whites, this is, in fact, it's a big partisan difference. Whites who tend to be Republicans tend to see themselves as whites with a white identity. And that in part comes from a sense that they are losing majority status. Uh, and correctly, so they are losing uh, majority status and a, a sense of a, a lost hegemony. The other phenomena that began really after the election of 1992 and has continued on pace and Trump first certainly accelerated it is the rise of authoritarianism as a characteristic of one party. Again, in this case, it's Republicans. The authoritarian mentality is measured by, one way of measuring it is uh, by how would you like to raise your children? Would you prefer them to be obedient or would you like them to be curious? Would you like them to be uh, thoughtful or would you like them to be, uh, 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 to, to respect their parents? These choices, which are odd choices, but they often, they, they help identify people who tend to be more authoritarian. It's not a bad thing, incidentally, to be authoritarian, although it sounds terrible because of the implications. It's just some parents have different views and they tend on how to bring up a kid. Uh, and that is a big difference. The fourth thing and fifth, they're all both together really, are the emergence of uh, a politics of hate and anger, what's called negative partisanship, Effect, and it's also called effective polarization versus ideological polarization. This is the a growth among partisans of the perception of the other party as a hostile negative force that in fact is likely to attack things in your life that are fundamental to your identity. You see the opposition party as a threat, but a, a more dire threat than to someone who might beat you in election as a threat to your actual person. And I hope, again, I will try to explain this further as we go along. Now, this is just simple effects of, of gerrymandering shown in this slide. This is Wisconsin. In 2008, the, uh, it was before the state had been gerrymandered. And you can see on the left side, Democrats won 56% of the vote uh, and they got in the assembly 52% of the seats. Republicans won 44% and they got 46 uh, of the seats. Uh, I, that That is sort of not too, it's a tilt to the Republicans, but not much. 
In 2012, after the redistricting that I described that uh, for Republicans, when they had full control with Scott Walker and the governorship and both branches of the legislature, Democrats in 2012 won 53%, but they only got 39% of the seats, whereas Republicans got 47%, but they got 60% of the seats. That's what you can do with redistricting and that this was done in Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, all over the country where Republicans had full control. The engineers of this were Carl Rove and Ed Gillespie who raised a small fortune to do it. They had, a, I think the program was called Red State and they, they, uh, they caught Democrats totally by surprise doing this. Uh, but it really changed the shape of politics for the, that, the whole decade of which we're now at the end of. Uh, this is what happens when you have house seats increasingly redistricted by gerrymandering. What happens is the share of competitive seats, that's the ones that are in uh, striped lines, not the black ones, which are safe seats, but these ones, the share of safe of competitive seats steadily declines here it, uh, and the share of safe seats steadily grows. The effect of that is actually to suppress votes in it in by my definition, which is that voters in these districts with safe uh, incumbents, where this, the incumbent, whether it be a Democrat or Republican, does not need to worry about the general election because the seat is guaranteed virtually to elect a member of one party and not the other. In those seats, everyone who is a member of the other party is basically had their vote suppressed. They don't have a choice. Where you have a choice is in marginal districts, and those are the ones where voters, that there are fewer and fewer of them. This only goes to 2010. There are actually fewer even further if this chart had been extended. Uh, another way to look at this is uh, the number of candidates where the, the candidate for the House is of the same party as the candidate for the president. Back in 1976, there was a, a large amount of ticket splitting. You can see it here. And many voters were dividing their tickets. By gerrymandering so many house seats and by making them so uniform, you've reduced the number of seats where you have a vote in a congressional district for a Republican but it has a Democratic uh, representative in Congress. Those people are, in this one, it's down almost at the end here to roughly uh, just 10 seats. Uh, it's, it, it, uh, again, this is a, a demonstration of a lack of competition that has become sort of embedded in the system. When you don't have competition, you don't, you are, again, using what I think is a correct definition, you are suppressing the vote. If without competition, there is no real choice for millions of people. Um, if you go back to 1992, which when Bill Clinton ran against George H.W. Bush, this is a picture of how Congress, of, of counties, not congressional districts, of how counties voted. In fact, there are roughly 3,000 counties in the United States, and Clinton won just under half of them, and Bush won just over half of them. It was really 1,500 each in, with a little difference. And as you can see, the blue counties are spread out all over the place, especially through the whole uh, sort of central time zone here but even Georgia, Clinton did carry Georgia, interestingly, back in 1992. Uh, but you see uh, a lot of the Midwest, except for Indiana, 
Uh, you see, this, at any rate, there was a, a lot of dispersal of the vote. If you go just to Hillary's case, she won virtually more votes and a larger percentage than Bill Clinton, but she only won in roughly 450, 460 counties compared to 2,600 that Trump won. All her vote is now become concentrated virtually, well, not all, but most of her vote is concentrated on the coasts, these areas, with a little bit uh, in more democratic urban areas, but again, the whole the the the, the middle the west the mid, I'm sorry the the middle of the country has turned red. There is now this huge geographic divide. This is the house in that same year. Again, the house the house the blue the blue which is the light and dark blue is spread out all over the place, and the red is. Uh, is also spread out. This is the house in this year. To, and again, what you see is the diminution of house districts across the country that are competitive. The Democrats actually have as many had going into 2020, nearly as many as they had in 1992, but they are again concentrated in heavy urban areas. Uh, Now we get to partisan hostility. Um, uh, I'm sure most of you know and have read about the degree to which people in the parties hate each other, and they do. This is a graph showing the warmth people feel towards their own party, which is the red line, and it stayed pretty has stayed con pretty consistent all the way from uh, the mid '70s to 2000. 20 right now in the 70, mid 70s range. Whereas this one here is the attitude, 50% is neutral. Uh, this is warm, this is cold. The feelings towards the party have now, have, have gone over that toward the opposition party have dropped from uh, almost exactly 50% to, they've dropped in half to 25%. People of each party feel much colder towards the other party. The result has been what I think is a very distorted perception of the two parties. And here is asking Republicans, how much of a threat to America is each individual person or group? Uh, Nancy Pelosi tops the scale, if you can see it. Uh, I don't know if we can, at uh, 88 and Antifa at 88, but people are saying she is much more of a threat to America than say Iran, which is only 76% or Kim Jong-un 72% uh, or P Putin 63%. Th this is basically simply crazy people this is not she obviously is not anywhere near as much a threat uh, to the country as, as as North Korea or frankly most of these people in uh, 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 Putin uh, they see the mainstream media as a bigger threat to the uh, than Iran on the other side Democrats are uh, their top one is, is uh, white supremacist. The next one is Donald Trump. Uh, and I must say, as personally, I'm inclined to agree with that, but I don't think it's a fair statement. But they see those as bigger threats, again, than Kim Jong-un, uh, who is 72% compared to 90%. Uh, this is Democrats' perception of, of threats to the, the, uh, the country. Uh, and foreign terrorists at 68% compared to 90% for Donald Trump uh, or 82% for the Republican Party. The, the perceptions of the parties have become 
distorted. They just are, they, these are not realistic assessments. They are emotional assessments. Here's another example. Given how extreme attitudes are among partisans, it's not likely to change in the future. Uh, the Republican Party has become taken over by racists among Democrats, 78%. Among Republicans, the Democratic Party has been taken over by socialists, 81%. Uh, These divides have been compounded by what a huge economic and geographic divide. This chart, which is a little harder to follow, but uh, in 1916, way, way back, nearly more than a century ago, there was very little difference in the voting between over here are very rural areas to very urban area, very rural on the left, very urban on the right. Basically, it was the same Democrat-Republican split. In 1960, there began to be more of an urban uh, tilt in the Democratic Party. This is the uh, share of the presidential voting uh, over these periods. By 2016, the Democratic share in very rural areas had fallen to roughly 30%. Whereas in very urban areas, it had grown to roughly 80%. So you see a huge split, and this is a geographic division. This geographic division has been echoed in effect by a, a strange phenomenon. If you remember, I, 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 I said that uh, Hillary and Joe Biden both won roughly 460, 470 counties compared to Trump, who, who in both years won better than two and a half thousand counties, basically a ratio in number of counties of uh, five to one in Trump's favor. But what about the economic product from these counties? This is a, uh, these, uh, the blue side is the, basically the contribution to GDP the national gross domestic product by the counties that uh, Biden won. And this is the contribution to GDP by the counties that Trump won. That the Biden counties, you can see this here, generated 70% of America's GDP in 2018. Uh, and the more than 2,400 counties won by Donald Trump generated 29%, a huge difference. Even though that Trump's Trump land is bigger, many more counties, and it covers much more of America, its contribution to the economy is much smaller. What that means is Democratic counties are prospering and Republican counties are not. Here's another example that you can see here. Hillary won 472 counties to Trump's uh, 2584. Then the split between the share of GDP was 34 to, I mean, 64 to 36. It, with Biden, he wins virtually the same number of counties, 477, and Trump to 2497. But the split between these counties grows even further. This is part of a process where the Democratic Party is becoming increasingly associated uh, with the elite. And you can see this in the changing education levels of the parties. Uh, over here are the Democrats on the right-hand side. The number of Democrats, the light, the lightest brown who have a college uh, degree from 1997 to 2017, a matter of just 20 years, uh, grew from 24% of Democratic voters to 39%. That's a 
statistically a huge increase. The, the number of what has been widely described as the working class, which means those without college educations at all, has fallen from 49% to 30%. Conversely, the Republican Party has basically stayed almost the same during these years. Uh, but the effect of this is the Democratic Party is losing what had been a working class base. And it used to be that the Democrats were, and if you went back prior to 1997, these, the differences would be much bigger. And the Republican Party 35 years ago was much more the party of the college educated and the Democratic Party was much more the party of those with no college. Uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist has documented this and he calls this uh, the emergence of Brahmin left-wing parties. That means sort of upscale Brahmin, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly how you define that, but it's sort of the, like a Boston Brahmin as someone who lives uh, in the best part of Boston, goes to Harvard, the kids go to Harvard. Uh, what you see here uh, in the US, which is the blue line, the steady increase in the share of voters who have college degree, democratic voters who have college degrees. And the same pattern is taking place in France, where that's the red line, where the share of voters with uh, college degrees, again, is growing. Uh, now, you can say at one level, it's fine to have a party that has a lot of well-educated, presumably smart people. Uh, but at another level, you are changing the character of the party. And you are, in fact, what's happened is now that the Democratic Party has become an upstairs, downstairs party. It has people prospering. And by that, it means not just Silicon Valley, but in that whole uh, economic split. Democrats live in areas that are growing. They have better jobs. Democrats on the whole are dealing with globalization, for example, much better than Republicans in terms of their demographics. The Republican counties are the counties that have struggled with growing trade, with the drop, the exporting of manufacturing jobs, uh, and where, where and the rise of jobs that require advanced education. That has been very difficult in these Republican counties for them to deal with, whereas Democrats on the whole, many have not among Democrats, especially poor minority Democrats have not thrived particularly, but many have. And you have this split of an upstairs downstairs split, which, causes another problem that I would say amounts to a form of voter suppression, but it's pretty twisted logic, but that's the way my logic works. And that is that the candidates the Democratic Party will now nominate will often represent the interests of the best off in any given congressional district people with money and with power and with educations tend to exercise much more influence, especially in a primary when the candidate is selected than people who have less education, less money. The people that more the more affluent have the money to give campaigns. They are more civic in that they participate in elections. So you get a, a denial within the Democratic Party of what might be the kind of candidate that those on the downstairs side of the coalition would want. Uh, has not been enough work on this, but I, 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 this is a phenomenon. Uh, what's interesting is that the more education you get, it doesn't make you more reasonable. Actually, in terms of this notion of effective or identity uh, partisanship uh, uh, or affective partisanship, 
the more educated you are, the more uh, you, you actually disrespect for dissimilar people, i.e. Democrats like over here with college degrees are more disrespectful of Republicans and people who are not similar to them. The same is true for, for the very conservative. Education pushes people to extremes. Now, the Democratic Party in 2016 struggled in the, the Midwest core of the country. Uh, they got it, got those many of the Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan states back this year at the presidential level, although they did not make any gains at the legislative or congressional level, in fact, suffered losses. But what, what stands out about those states? They had been pretty reliable democratic uh, states. They had been known as the, a blue wall. Uh, you can see here, this is the exposure to robots. What that means is how many jobs, how many robots are coming in replacing workers. And you can see that it's the Midwest in here, which is the darkest color, where, that is most vulnerable to robots. And that's where the Democrats had their problem. Here is another map that shows similar the uh, tr exposure to trade. How much exposure to foreign trade coming in and replacing domestically produced uh, employment? Uh, how much did that? And you can see again, it is again a Midwest problem, although certainly Maine and North Carolina ha have had their problems, but. Uh, Again, though, you can see that the dark brown and darkish brown areas tend to be from Pennsylvania through this whole Midwest territory where Democrats have struggled. Um, race, uh, this is, it speaks for itself in effect. Uh, the Republican Party over time has increasingly become the party of white America. The share of the party of the Republican Party, that's the red line, that is white compared to what this is would be the share of the country as a whole has moved steadily from being slightly more white back here in, in the 1950s uh, than the country to, to much more white and then going way up in 2012 and 2016. Democrats have become more the party of minorities, but their move, their shift has not been quite as sharp as the uh, Republicans. This is another, this is a measure of what's called racial resentment. It's a series of questions that are really designed to test whether you empathize with minority Americans, especially blacks, or whether you think their problems are their own fault. Uh, there's some disagreement about the quality of this measure, but the important thing is in a matter of just two years from 2016 when Trump was first elected, to 2018, the share of Republicans who were the, at the highest level of racial resentment shot up. And at the other end of the scale, which is one which really represents racial empathy or sympathy for the plight of black and minority uh, Americans, the share of Democrats shot up. You have the two parties, another way to look at it is most of the action in 2016 was in the middle. Now you're getting pushed with the Democratic Party moving further and further to the left on this scale and the Republican Party moving further and farther to the right on this scale. Uh, so you're getting a, uh, a, a big difference. This is what, the, uh, at any rate, that, that's, uh, now, I've been talking about these different kinds of polarization. 
most people think of polarization as ideological. One side believes in free markets and don't regulate uh, the economy, don't regulate uh, the environment, uh, don't spend too much, avoid deficits. So the, and the other side believes that government should intervene to help uh, the poorest people, should uh, spend money when needed, especially to build up jobs. That's ideological polarization. That kind of polarization has been replaced by this notion of effective AFFECT polarization. My team against them, more intense hostility to the opponent, loyalty to the leader who can do no wrong. Uh, it's hard to describe this, except when you think of the way people, people have absorbed their partisan, uh, partisan identification, their sense of their whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, literally into their identity. It's become being a Republican has gained a value to those who hold that view that supersedes the simple, I, I tend to vote for these guys as opposed to the other guys. It's become part of your, your, your being in a sense. And uh, so that when the other side attacks you, the Democrats, they're not just uh, pushing for a different agenda and they're, uh, you know, the, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. They're attacking you personally. Uh, I, I think one of, the, we'll, we'll see this in a second, but uh, you can see this in a number of ways. One is the, the hostility level towards the opposition. Members that this is a pew graph Members of the opposing party are not just worse for politics, they're downright evil. That's a pretty serious thing to say. That's very different from what, say, people would have said in 1990s, 1980s, 1970s. For roughly 42, 43% of each party agrees with that statement that the other side is downright evil. Now, effective polar, uh, polarization influences how you think and the kind of moral judgments you make. And I think one of the best examples of this is this one. Uh, this tract answers to the question, can an elected official who commits an immoral act in their personal life still behave ethically and fulfill their duties in public and professional life? White evangelicals in 2011 were, as you would expect, most of them said no by a strong margin and compared to uh, mainline ca uh, Protestants, Catholics and all Americans, they were much more negative on that question. A public official cannot be a good person, be a good public official and bad in his personal life. In 2016, with Trump as the nominee, suddenly they go from the most critical of that view to the most liberal on that view, from 30 up to 72%. This is a 42% increase in a matter of just five years. Uh, th this is effective po polarization at work uh, in overdrive. Another interesting thing that actually is very significant going on now is that the white evangelical share of the population and its share of the vote have gone in two different ways. The percentage of white evangelicals as a share of the population has dropped from 2004 to 2018, from 23 to 15%, but their share of the national electorate, their share of the vote counted on uh, November 3rd, has stayed absolutely constant at 26% from 2008 to 2018 and presumably 2020. This means this is a group that feels very threatened by the liberal majority. Not only do they feel threatened, they have been mobilized by this opposition to the liberal majority and by their support for Trump 
uh, in a way that has produced an extraordinary record of continued sustained turnout despite a sustained decline in their, their share of the electorate. Uh, this again is affective polarization uh, operating uh, in a very, very forceful fashion. Uh, the country has had over these, or, well, more than you know, 40 years, a growing division on values. Uh, here's some questions that are asked of uh, liberals uh, where they are very favorable to the question. They're asked, do you agree or disagree, basically? And conservatives disagree. These are where the disagreement is the highest. Respect for authority is something all children need to learn. But that actually, uh, that, this is wrong. This, I don't know. Well, let's do it the other way. It's actually conservatives. Conservatives agree with liberals say no. Respect for authority is something all children need to learn. Liberals believe that is not something children need to learn. Conservatives believe that it is the best thing to learn. This goes back to the authoritarian issue that I was talking about before. War is sometimes the best way to solve a conflict. Liberals on the other side of the coin will say uh, the biggest difference is uh, peace is the most important thing to achieve. Liberals are very pro that, conservatives do not agree with that. Uh, if certain groups stayed in their place, uh, we would have fewer problems. Uh, and finally, the old fashioned ways and old fashioned values still show the best way to live. Uh, What I would argue is that these value differences have become so dominant, they in effect, basically the political system has been asked to absorb issues of lifestyle. And as a result, issues of, of just plain economic well-being have been subordinated Issues of lifestyle do not lend themselves to political solution. They lend themselves to political conflict. Uh, and really they are not resolvable by the political system. A person's beliefs, uh, the traditional Christian who goes to church and believes that the Bible is inerrant, is gonna hold those beliefs and you're not gonna have a political system change those beliefs just as the, a liberal who believes that most moral choices are subjective, that there is no external fixed morality, those views are not part of the political system. But in effect, I would argue that by having those issues become so dominant in the system, voters have been have had their choices suppressed. And most voters would want to, I believe, would prefer a system where they have a choice for political parties that offer them alternatives uh, on how to better improve their own life, particularly on an economic basis. But that choice is not available in this current situation of effective polarization of this values matter. Uh, and this is, I think, a serious problem. I know it does not coincide exactly with the idea of voter suppression, uh, which is a serious issue and a serious problem, and I don't mean to diminish it, but it, it uh, but I think it provides a, uh, a background to what we are seeing that is significant and important. And uh, uh, 
Uh, let me leave it there. And I, I would be delighted to take any questions or thoughts or statements, whatever you like. Uh, I hope I haven't overstayed my welcome. No, Tom, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, and so the bad thing about Zoom is we can't have people just raising hands and asking questions to, to keep order. We sort of um, I've been fed the questions um, and people have put them in the chat as well. So I'm going to ask some of them. Now, one of them that had come over before your talk and that came over in the chat um, was that the outcomes in 2020 suggest voter registration drives in Georgia and Arizona made significant impact in boosting, had a significant impact in boosting prospects for Democrats. Do you expect these gains to hold or will Republicans regain the upper hand in coming years? And how do you explain why these two states changed while most Southern states remained dominated by, I'm assuming the rest of it is Republicans, by Republicans. Are the gains in Georgia and Arizona potentially able to be replicated in other states? I'm assuming the word Stacey Abrams will have to figure into your answer to that, but um, go ahead, please. All right. Well, certainly Stacey Abrams has been a key player in Georgia and has mobilized uh, the black community like no one else has before. Uh, but both Arizona and uh, Georgia have substantial growth in the number of one immigrants moving in. And Atlanta, for example, is a very sophisticated area. It's not like uh, a backwater. And uh, you, there was, uh, the New York Times has a story on this either today or yesterday by Nate Cohn, who's very, very good. Uh, he, he describes the growing support for Biden in the, basically in the white suburbs. So you have two forces at work in a place like Georgia. White suburbs turning a well-educated white suburbs to go back to my point about education being a big factor and the black community together joining forces and producing what may be a winning majority. That'll be tested in, under the most adverse kind of situation in the January 5th runoff election there. Uh, runoff elections almost always hurt Democrats but uh, and they're dis they advantage Republicans but we'll see how it goes. It's, uh, uh, it's gonna be a, obviously a huge fight and there was so much more attention on it than normal that you can't count it like a normal runoff. Uh, but I think uh, there had been similar trends going on in Texas, especially in the suburbs of Houston, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, uh, but that basically came to a halt in this election. But in 2018, Democrats were making major gains in those uh, urban, suburb, urban and suburban areas. Uh, uh, Alabama is going to be slow and Florida slower still. Uh, it's, it's hard to... Uh, North Carolina, everyone ex always expects to start moving in a purple direction because of the Raleigh-Durham uh, area and the rise of the increasing number of Northerners moving into the state, but it, it just it hasn't happened. And uh, uh, again, we'll see what, although they have now twice elected a Democratic governor, uh, Roy Cooper. So, uh, and, Democrats now have a pretty firm hold in the uh, the uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada area of the West, which is a pretty good group of states to, to have a stronghold in uh, over time gain uh, increase uh, congressional districts. Uh, but anyway, I, I think I, I, I don't think they're, they're, those states are alone. They're, they're the, at the leading edge of a trend. 
So there's several other um, questions. Um, <clears throat> so one of them is, um, and I think you touched on this in your column today or the other day, <clears throat> Why did so many Latinos vote for Trump? I think there's a perception that Trump got an inordinately large percentage of the Latino vote um, uh, and had chipped away at African-American vote, particularly among men, right? There, uh, so I'm interested in what you, what you think of that because it's not, uh, the numbers are not that much different than what Bush got is my understanding, but I'm interested in your response to, that, to the, the, the uh, participants question. Well, it's a good question because Bush got, did well among, relatively well among Hispanics, but he was a very forthright advocate of uh, supporting the inclusion of Hispanics and really, uh, and he was for immigration reform in a pro-Hispanic fashion. That's not the case with uh, Trump. The, uh, I, the Hispanic vote is clearly more complex than Democrats understood it to be. And the issue of socialism and communism in the Venezuelan and Cuban communities clearly seemed to hurt Democrats and Biden uh, in those Miami-based communities. In South Texas, it's something else altogether, and I'm no expert on that, but from what I've read, there is a strong strain among Hispanics there who do not like to be treated like a minority. They want to be treated as Americans. And uh, Ian Lopez had a column in the New York Times on this uh, where how, how surprised he was to discover this, that, the, that there, there is a strong sort of uh, constituency among Hispanics who wanted to be, who want to be treated as aspirational Americans. They want to be seen as trying to get ahead. And uh, I think Trump tapped into that. The third big factor is that the fastest growing religion in the Hispanic community Catholics are still the majority, but the fastest growing is the evangelical uh, Christian movement, especially Pentecostals. And those voters are the most likely to vote Republican among Hispanics. So there, I think there's a complex situation going on there. The, uh, the third thing that among men of all minorities, it may be that Trump had kind of a masculine appeal and uh, a, a sort of a he-man kind of thing. And again, there has not been enough work to really examine this to, to reach any conclusion. Thank you. Um, another one of the questions, actually, I wanna, I'll ask a question about, so I, I was quite intrigued with your conclusions here about um, your political party has become a core identity Right, and the idea that the more educated you are as a Democrat or as a Republican, the more disrespectful or disdainful you are of the other side. So this is, I know that the biggest push uh, in many circles, and I think it's a smart one, would be to organize, right? Get the vote out, Biden won by getting the vote out. But I'm also wondering if two other kinds of, you know, the, what roles can universities play? So for example, in Finland, they teach internet skepticism, right? You're, you're taught how to identify fake websites, not like the fake, fake news that's been going on. I wonder if the US could do something like that. But I'm also wondering, there's a, there's a strain in certain kinds of social thought about teaching the ability to, 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 to disagree civilly, which sounds like a really Pollyannish 1950s thing to, to teach. But I wonder if it's a thing we should think about making part of a core curriculum, those two things. I, I don't know, I'm just interested what your thoughts are. Uh, I think it, it would be certainly worth experimenting to see how well those kind, that kind of a program would work. The, uh, but I think you really need to start that uh, in high school or even grade school, much more than by the time kids are in college, uh, that this, kind of 
uh, willingness to tolerate opposing views is something you have to learn much younger than in, than in college. And uh, this may be the decline of civics education in general has in, in, as part of the public school uh, curricula. Uh, but I think there has to be a way to do it and there has to be a way to do it that doesn't come off as being politically correct, uh, which also will tend to alienate a lot of parents who don't agree if, it, if it's given any kind of tilt I, it's a real, it's a very difficult thing to do, I think, more difficult than people realize. And kids will detect phoniness very quickly. Uh, so I, I think it's certainly worthwhile if it could have an effect and it be worthwhile on a large scale if it could work. But I don't know. Um, okay, another question. We've got a couple of these. <laughs> So you talked about gerrymandering as the single most effective way to suppress the vote. So what are your preferred fixes? If you were, if you were in charge of fixing these things, what would you do? I think these commissions, which can theoretically be problematic, but uh, commissions where when they cannot come to an agreement, they would go to a uh, well, again, the courts can be pretty partisan too. It's it's hard to address, but I think uh, these are decisions that should not be left in the hands of politicians who have so much self-interest at stake. If it can, if you can, you can reduce the self-interest effect through the use of commissions, and they have worked pretty well in a lot of states that have tried them, where you produce fairly competitive districts. Uh, uh, I think Arizona has one, and I think uh, oh, Iowa may have one, and they have been, I don't, I think Michigan may be on the move towards this, and there, there are other states, and I think uh, uh, California clearly did this. Um, so I, th I think trying to just simply make it a little less political and maybe a lot less political is the best thing to do. Uh, and because I think it, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, Let me ask you another about another possible solution. There's been a lot of discussion about the idea of ranked choice voting, which studies show decreases polarization because you don't have to buy in only to one candidate, you, you rank them. Your top candidate's number one, but if that person wins or gets knocked out, then your second choice uh, person gets counted. And it's a way to express, it rewards voters who can get more people to rank them highly than just to rank, like in all the primaries, the most extreme voters pick the candidates. What have you, have you had any, have you done any thinking about rank choice voting as a, a possible uh, solution to the polarization issue, which I know is driven by gerrymandering, but is also in itself, I think, a separate structural problem at this point. Uh, I agree, and I think uh, ranked choice voting is certainly worth trying. Uh, they've got it in Maine now, and uh, uh, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened to the vote had uh, Sue Collins fallen below 50%. It only applies when uh, the top candidate doesn't get 50%. Um, uh, as long as the voters understand it, I think it's fine. I've seen some other places like Cambridge, Massachusetts has a very arcane method of doing this. And I think a lot of voters just don't know what's going on. Uh, but uh, but it, you're right that it, they could help uh, assuage some of the uh, uh, polarization. I'm a little wary of trying to get rid of polarization, which is so sort of embedded in people's views and values through procedural changes. I, 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 it may work, but I'm not sure. So we also have a question from Marion Engelman about whether or not the polarization patterns at the national level uh, replicate themselves 
uh, at state levels? And are they more extreme or less extreme? Do you have any thoughts about, you know, maybe there could be some states that were laboratories to decrease this? Have you thought about this idea of the state level polarization? Is it fundamentally different? Uh, actually, this whole thing, polarization starts at the top and it's been seeping steadily down. That's where you see the decline of congressional districts where they vote differently from the way they vote for the president. They now are sort of in lockstep, overwhelmingly in lockstep. And so are whole states when they pick their Senate, US Senate people. And I think that's filtering down, and I'm pretty sure it's filtering down to the state legislative level. Uh, uh, I, uh, and I'm not, uh, well, at any rate, it, uh, I think it's, I think it's polarization is kind of like a cancer and it's very hard to stop. And no one now really has a sure way of excising it. And do you excise it by procedural rules that don't allow it to flourish? Do you actually, I don't know. It's a, it's a, uh, and polarization in theory there's nothing wrong with the parties differing. They should differ. It's when it becomes a, uh, when it turns into sort of hostile warfare and that's when it becomes much more problematic. And you saw a lot of this in areas where people were tearing down signs. Someone would put up a Biden sign in a semi-rural area and the thing would get ripped down. I think one guy even took a, uh, tried to shoot a couple of people that were taking down signs. And you see it in the, uh, the, the level of intensity behind people's feelings has, has gotten beyond the pale of political, democratic political management. And uh, uh, there, there may be steps, but I'm not sure what they are. So, um... There was an appreciative comment about the lecture, but the person said, the question was, um, you show that the Democrats are losing the working class and that Republicans have suffered more from globalization than Democrats. One would expect those suffering economically to turn to the Democrats who promote policies that should support, that support them economically, like giving everyone health insurance. Why is this not happening? I think it's a fair question. I, I think you have insights and you have grim insights into why it's not happening, but I'm, I'm interested to, as to what they are. Um, I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, one is that the Democratic Party, especially under Bill Clinton, uh, who I liked, I have to say, but at any rate, under him and even under Obama, became the party of foreign trade. NAFTA was a it was proposed by the Bush administration, but it was enacted under the, the Clinton administration. And his people, Larry Summers, uh, they were uh, basically, and Robert Rubin were supportive of deregulation uh, of the, the whole process. They're basically supportive of a deregulated globalized economy. And I think people know that. They also know that most Democrats, many of them now live in areas that have not been hurt by globalization, that have in fact been helped by globalization, whereas those in Republican areas have been hurt by it. But this goes back to much deeper issues. Uh, the whole kind of what's the matter with Kansas question, which I could give another whole lecture on. Uh, and. Uh, it, 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 it will be too much, but I think basically the Democrats, they lost a lot of whites because they were for civil rights and there was no way around that. They, that if they're gonna say sort of an ethical party, they, there was no uh, way of, of avoiding that. But I think they have been involved They've become the party of insurgencies, of the black insurgency in the 1960s, 
women's rights in the later 60s and 70s, gay rights, uh, all of these are insurgencies. And when you are the party of change, which the part the Democratic Party is, you become, you disrupt society. Uh, you change the, the social order and you change the moral order. The, the gay rights movement has changed the moral order uh, across America. There are gonna be some people who are gonna be very upset by that. There's no way around that. If you are gonna be the party of change and insurgency, the party needs to, that that party needs to take more care in addressing the people who are hurt, and I think the Democratic Party did did not do that, and instead, as many of the the Republicans now say, they feel looked down upon by liberal elites, and so I. Uh, I, I think the Democratic Party allowed itself, one, to be perceived as an elite, to, two, to actually be an elite, and three, to neglect dealing with the costs that it was imposing that were inevitable whenever you do the changes that the party was advocating. It's interesting, right? Because it's like the globalization, like the robot displacement graph that you showed that clearly hit like the blue wall that the Democrats lost in 2016 and got back. Right. Yes. It's interesting, though, that like gay marriage, for example, that was a big issue in 2004. That's one of the reasons that Bush um, won that election. Right. Because of yes. the threat of that. But it's it's an interesting thing. It, it's part of me thinks I don't see the heart. I mean, and I know this comes from me, but I don't see that being the same kind of harm. Like if, if all the factories around where you live are being closed, you're clearly getting hurt, right? But there's gay people everywhere and they've wanted to have families and get married forever. It's, a, it's, it's interesting that the Republicans have been able to turn that into an issue that's again like white religious nationalism. It's been a mobilizing issue, even though we now have gay marriage as the law of the land. That that this this fight against gay people as a as a as a as a as a cultural and political divide has I think it's still been uh, effective. But I'm I'm inter It's not the same kind of injury, right? The the cultural change versus the economic one. I wonder if you want to if you're if that's a thing that is interesting to for, to you to talk a bit about. I uh, well, one. I think the gay rights movement is is probably achieved more popular support faster than any thing that I've ever seen from 2004, when it was a negative for the Democrats, to 2012, when it became a positive part of Obama's agenda and proved to be a winner. That's in a matter of uh, uh, eight years. Uh, so you got a flip on a very controversial issue. That, that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, and I think that in, that in fact, the gay issue uh, didn't hurt. But what you have though, well, how can I explain this? If you're a uh, factory worker uh, in Michigan and you're, son or daughter is not going to go to college, you don't think. You're saying you want that son and daughter to be equipped to probably follow in your footsteps and get a job in a factory. But along comes the Democratic Party, which seems to advocate a liberal social order where it seems as if they support anything goes. And then your kid says to you, screw you, dad, I'm not gonna do what you're telling me to do. And the son gets a girl pregnant and the daughter gets pregnant. You blame this on liberalism. I'm not saying that's fair, but that's an economic cost that you see being imposed on your family 
by the liberal cultural ethic. Again, I am not making a. You're channeling. You're not. You're not endorsing this position. I'm not endorsing it. Yeah. But I think the perception is uh, that that liberals al allow for disorder for people whose lives cannot tolerate too much disorder. That guy knows that his son will not last on the job if he says screw you to his boss. He will be out on his ear. And he knows that his daughter is gonna have a hell of a life if she's stuck with a kid without, and the, 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 whoever she got pregnant with it disappeared. So Tom, we are at the end of our time. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one. There's two questions come in. I'll ask them together. If you can give brief answers before we close up. So, um, your column today talked about um, the divisions within the Democrat Democratic Party. Uh, you know, the Biden wing and the the AOC wing, and there's a lot of different. It's a big tent with lots of different people in it. Um, what should Biden do going forward? What should AOC or Liz Warren or others do going forward? The second question, you can, and they're the biggest ones, right? What can Biden fix or advance if he has, if he doesn't have the Senate, what can he fix or advance by executive order or regulations or other things? How much of the damage done can he, un he undo? And this is, and I'm going to do like the radio thing, you know, we have only a certain amount of time and then we're going to, We'll, we'll have to close up shop here because the dean has turned his camera back on, which is my signal to um, to begin to move the, to a conclusion. Uh, just really quickly, there's a lot he can do uh, by on environmental issues, workplace, environment, all these things were in many cases uh, executive orders or regulatory policies adopted by Trump, and he can just simply reverse those. So he can certainly correct a lot that was done. He is not, in that sense, limited. And Trump, if you're an environmentalist or if you're a union person who wants the workplace to be safe, a lot of other consumer, if you're worried about the consumer regulation of meat, for example, all these things, there's a ton of stuff there that can be done in a second. Without the Senate, though, he has a big problem because, per, well, this is me personally, I think that what he needs to do is an economic program. And it has to be one that provides assistance to everyone, red state and blue state. And uh, we are in a bad time period. A lot of people, small business are getting killed. Uh, people are losing jobs. It's a very, very difficult time. And I don't think he's gonna be able to get that through the Senate. That though I think a universalistic agenda, one that benefits all who qualify, uh, is what he should focus on. And frankly, so should uh, AOC should jump on board just as Joe Manchin should jump on board. Uh, but I, his ability is gonna be really constrained. Uh, so we'll see. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to thank you, Tom Edsel, for speaking tonight. Uh, I also want to send a shout out to the team of Diana Lazov, Angelina Delgado, uh, to the Engelman family, um, and to everyone else who, who brought this lecture to us tonight. David, do you want us to uh, give the closing benediction here? Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, Tom. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation full of rich ideas about how to address the many divisions that we're facing today. Uh, and I don't think it will be the last. I did want to say that there will be at least one more program on the, on the election, now the post-election, uh, on the likely policy directions of the Biden administration, given all the constraints and given that we'll probably be doing this before we know where the US Senate is going to wind up uh, with the Georgia special coming up next uh, in, in January, rather. Uh, so lots of good stuff. I want to add my thanks to everybody that Rob just thanked. Uh, we couldn't do it without all of you. But I also wanted to thank those of you who have joined us in the audience tonight. Uh, I see many, many familiar names around the bezel. Uh, and 
your interest in what we have done during the course of the season to try to inform people about what's going on in the election and now what's happening in the aftermath uh, is, is inspiring. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Tom Edsel. Thank you, Engelmans. Thank you, Rob Smith. Uh, this has been a terrific evening and it won't be the last. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Diana Lazov, for making all of this run.